morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever you are. Uh, another really, really cool one today. So we have uh, not with us just Mr. Stefan Goss, but we have Stephen Pear uh, from BitPay. And, you know, it's going to be really hard to, to get a, a, a true answer out of him. But like, this is one of the OG OGs of crypto. And he's going to hate me even even announcing him like that. Um, but but Stephen, when was when was your first exposure to, to Bitcoin? Oh, goodness. Uh, the first exposure was a slash dot article that talked about the you know, start of Bitcoin uh, back in 20, 2009. Um, I didn't really do anything with that. I just kind of read the article and thought it was a silly idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until late 2010 that I actually sat down and read the uh, Satoshi white paper and then started getting really, uh, you know, deep into it. And, and when you, you know, as we kind of remember back in the days, you know, it, this was just a theoretical thing that a, that a team of unknowns put out. And so it's really hard for people today that are just now getting into Bitcoin. They're like, Oh my God, you know, who was into it? What, I mean, th they were fractions of a penny, um, mm -hmm. you know, to get them, you almost had to mine them in the early mm -hmm. days if you wanted any access to them because the internet yep. wasn't what it was. I mean, this is, you know, 2010 internet. Um, not, not, I mean, the internet today. was pretty close to what it is today, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but certainly, uh, finding people and, and buying Bitcoin was hard to do. Absolutely. So how, so did you, um, so talk, tell us real, uh, real quick about kind of what you were doing with it or, or how you started messing with it. And, yeah. and what was that kind of the aha moment where, where it became like, I need to start diverting that actual time and energy to this. Yeah. I mean, the aha moment was really reading the Satoshi white paper and, um, but there's a lot leading up to that point. Um, so the, the Satoshi White, so my background is computer science. I studied that at Georgia Tech and um, started messing with computers when I was uh, seven or eight years old in the 1970s. I'm dating myself, but, uh, um, and so I grew up, you know, as a developer, you know, writing, writing software and, and uh, um, the, uh, so reading that white paper was uh, the aha moment. It was, the beauty of the Satoshi white paper um, was really struck me and, and, and reading it, it just laid out very plainly how the system worked. It wasn't, uh, you know, steeped in a lot of um, PhD jargon or anything like that. It was just very plain, uh, very simple. And you read it and you're like, ah, wow, why didn't we think of this 20 years ago? So back up from there, 20 years prior to that in the early 1990s was really when I kind of got interested in this idea of, payment systems for the internet. There was something called uh, DigiCash that I would characterize as the world's first um, cryptographic payment system. And while it was uh, used cryptography to secure the payment, it was a centralized system. And, uh, and you know, they got, they got a bank signed up uh, at the time and it was a dollar pegged kind of system, but um, it was taking money out of the bank putting it in a format that was on the internet and allowing it to move and transact between people. Um, and then you can put it back into the bank at some point if you wanted. And, um, uh, but again, it was a centralized system run by DigiCash. And when DigiCash went bankrupt, that payment system went away with it. And so this was the early 1990s and it coincided with a lot of other things that I was interested in, like Phil Zimmerman at the time was working on a pretty good privacy and trying to get that out there. Um, and I was following that whole saga with him, you know, skirting with going to jail and this strong cryptography uh, made available to people to use. And, you know, were it not for the efforts of him and the people around him and, and others, uh, we wouldn't have banking on the Internet today, or at least it would have been delayed by a significant amount of time. Um, so it, uh, it, but the DigiCash got me really interested in this concept of how do you create a payment system that doesn't depend on like one company or one central bank to run it. And, uh, and then I just fell down the rabbit hole from there studying about uh, central banking, the history of that, um, you know, read some conspiracy theories about all of that. And, um, and then, uh, you know, I read this one book called the creature from Jekyll Island. that was really enthralling. And it was like, uh, it was a conspiracy theory book, but it also laid out a lot of the history of central banking in the world and, and international finance. And, uh, you know, I just, um, you know, just got really interested in that topic. Uh, not that I really believed necessarily that there's 12 people on the planet that's controlling everything, but, um, um, but, uh, it was, it was a page turner. <laughs> and, uh, and so after that, I, 
I, I kept seeking out like projects that were um, trying to figure this out. Like if, uh, and, I, and I remember hearing one excellent point, which was uh, here we have this paper currency and that, that paper currency is worthless ink stamped on a worthless piece of paper, yet we assign it value. And the, con the implication of that is that it must be an information system. And if it's an information system, we should be able to replicate something like that entirely in the digital realm. And, uh, and then also do it without there needing to be like one central party controlling everything, you know, clearing all the payments, make sure, making sure things aren't double spent. And so I, I just kept seeking out projects through the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, then there were some interesting uh, things that gained a lot of attention, like Second Life Linden Dollars, World of Warcraft Gold. I don't know if you remember the stories of people back in the... Um, you know, in, in, uh, in Korea or China that were playing games to oh, yeah. you know, earn world of Warcraft gold. And, and, and those were, it was, they were interesting, fascinating developments. Um, but they were still there. There's technologically speaking, there was nothing interesting about them at all. They're just centralized ledger systems. Um, but interesting that they were, they were gaining attention. And then, um, you know, I, I guess in my career at some point through the, mid 2000s, I was just kind of like, well, this is just going to be impossible. We're just going to need payments on the internet to be cleared by a central party. And, um, and then 2010, I finally read the Satoshi white paper and I was like, oh, wow. You know, and then that's what all of that thinking led up. First, it led up to 2009, me seeing a headline that said, you know, run a computer algorithm and generate money. And everything I knew about economics says that can't possibly work. Oh yeah, no, that that yeah. that was that was so wild when it first came out, yeah. and and the thoughts you know to to of the the disconnect between any bank and a monetary value was was you know and and it's interesting to hear you talk about all these different projects because it's been a problem that for for decades people yeah. have said you know how do I create a currency how to get away from it and it's like well first off you have to have an army. Um, yep. And that army has to control <laughs> land, and then, then yeah. you have the government, and and they'll That's tell right. you what your what your piece of paper is worth. That's right. Yeah, um, uh, it, that that question was really what motivated me. It was like, how can you create money? Like like, it, it, as you think about it, it's like you get right to the crux of what money really is, and um, and and how could you do that without needing armies, without needing a government to force people to use it, without you know all these other things? How could you create something organically? And um, uh, it, it's a it's a really cool question. And uh, and I think Bitcoin has taught us a lot about about the true nature of money. And so anyway, I read the Satoshi white paper in late 2010, and um, you know I, I heard the headline, thought that can't possibly work, but I kept seeing some things about it, and I was like, all right, well maybe I need to sit down and look at this a little closer. I read the white paper and I was like, I was mad. I was like, why didn't I read this two years ago? Or, you know, and, uh, uh, but, I, I, but I was excited too, because it was like a really cool idea and, um, and, and seemed obvious in hindsight. <laughs> it was like, and, and also you kind of irritated that, you know, 20 years of my life have gone by without progress in this, uh, on this. And, uh, and now here it is, you know, and so that, that kind of motivated me to start thinking about, uh, and it lined up well with my career, uh, start thinking about, could I build a company around this of some kind? Uh, could I do something with this? Cause I was excited about it. I wanted to do something with it full time, not just as a hobby. And, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, I'd been with small companies before I was at IBM at the time and I was ready to get back to a small company. And so in many ways, BitPay was me you know, together with my co-founder creating the job that I wanted. And, and, and that was 2011 that you, yes, you, okay, so, so this is why I can easily assign you OG status yeah. <laughs> because in 2010, I also read the white paper and I read the wired article magazine that came out and I was playing a game uh, at the time called Eve online. And mm -hmm. you know, the, the story I say constantly is, is we figured, Oh, this will be great for us to use as a digital currency. This sounds like fun. And so one of the, one of the members of the, you know, there's a thousand people in this organization I was playing with says, Oh yeah, I'm mining these and yeah. sold and sold me a hundred for, for 20 bucks. 
Mm -hmm. sold a whole bunch of those. And, and, you know, later on when I was upgrading my computer and, and whatnot, I didn't even think about, you know, do I, what am I going to do with those things? Cause we never could figure out how to easily sell them. And if you, you know, if you yeah. can think way back to then, you know, the, the wallets and everything else, like this is pre Mount Gox, this was like, no, you know, yeah. still like a conceptual, um, you know, were in the works and the fact that you saw the value in the long term of it, because I looked at it and go, well, they're being clear that this is just a, a, a test to see if it can work and someone else will come along and create the real currency. So, yeah. um, and, and that's really the differentiator. I mean, uh, Stefan, what, what was your, yours is relatively similar to this. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I, it's actually, it was my roommate. It wasn't even me. He's like, Oh, this thing is hella cool. And so he wanted to start mining. And so we just started to doing some mining. So that was, but then yeah, same deal. It wasn't like, we're like, and I was running two other companies at the time. Right. And I wanted to stay focused. And so it was really more like more like that. But yeah, I'm really curious. What was the problem you guys like saw that you wanted to fix in the market? Like, because obviously there was like a whole bunch of things that needed to be solved. So like, what was that like, oh my God, we can do this part better. Like what was the original thesis? Well, so in 2011, Mt. Gox did already exist. And there were already, okay. you know, a handful of exchanges popping up all over the place. And so my co-founder, Tony and I were, you know, kind of discussing this. And by the way, I, I told Tony about it early in uh, 2011. And he kind of had the same reaction. He sort of was dismissive at first, but over time, as we talked about it, he came around and, you know, by May of that year, we had incorporated BitPay. Um, so, so in 2011, um, you know, there were already exchanges. And, uh, and so Tony and I, as we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do around this, um, we had kind of reached the conclusion that exchanges and, and trading of it was going to be commoditized over time. And that we wanted to focus on uh, building a platform that allowed companies and individuals to get real value out of the technology, as opposed to just being a speculative in instrument. Um, uh, I think now, 10 years later, it's finally starting to be commoditized. But uh, if I knowing what I know today, uh, I, we would have started an exchange. We would have uh, for sure been, you know, I should have known we could build a much better exchange than, than Mt. Gox. But you know, it, I guess the lesson there is, um, you know, don't be afraid of competition and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and don't overestimate how quickly things will mature and, and, uh, uh, and evolve. Right. So, but yeah, I, I, th I, th I like where we're at today. Um, but back then we should have started an exchange for sure. Uh, but but we did want to build a real platform, a platform, a, a platform that not a real platform, but a platform that, that companies get real value out of, uh, as opposed to just something that enables speculative uh, trading. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I just want to, you know, circle back around. And I think it's so easy uh, for today people to to have that, you know, hindsight is is 2020 because because yeah. clearly, um, you know, I, I had really never I still don't have any guilt on throwing away a computer with a hundred Bitcoins because A, it produces everyone else's. But but more than that, I, I never would have, I never would have held on to them. You know, when, when yep. these things hit a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, 500 yep. bucks, I easily would have been out. Um, yep. You know, I, I, I didn't, back then it was very hard to understand the long-term value. And so except for people like you, who, who were already in the financial system, you were looking for a solution. And this was like a piece of the puzzle that fit into the, to a larger picture. Um, yep. That just wasn't where I was at the time. I mean, and we ha we hear story after story after story of people that come into Y Whales and and you know they're the same thing. They have this this early exposure and then they get dis dismayed about it for you know anywhere from years to to a decade in some cases because yeah. they you know they just didn't hold it. And I think it's it's interesting to see um, how a mature company has has grown around this and you still have regrets of you could have done better. Um, and clearly, yeah. BitPay is doing very well today. You know. Well, there's, I don't care who you talk to in the, in the Bitcoin world, the crypto world. I don't care who it is. I don't care how much money they've made off of it with, without fail. Every single one of them will tell you that they wish they had bought more Bitcoin, right? <laughs> I don't care how many billions of dollars they have, you know, uh, but they will all wish they, they had bought more, um, you know, so. Yeah, there, there, there's nobody that that has enough. So, so before we jump into to, to BitPay, I, I'm not going to let you get away from some of the uh, Satoshi, uh, you know, rumors and thoughts. And you know, yeah. clearly, you've been in, in the space. You have a business dedicated to to Bitcoin and that white paper. You know, do, do you have any thoughts? And and again, reminding you that this will go public um, yeah. around who uh, who is behind Bitcoin. Well, I mean, if I did, first of all, I wouldn't 
wouldn't disclose it, uh, you know, because I think Satoshi does deserve, you know, his, her, their privacy, right? Um, but I will say this, I think that Bitcoin would not have worked were Satoshi not uh, anonymous. It also would not have worked uh, if the source code was not open source. Um, people needed to study the source code. My first, uh, one thing I didn't cover, talk about was, uh, first thing I really did with Bitcoin was uh, start studying the source code. And uh, to the degree that my computer science developer sensibilities were very offended by the structure of the source code. <laughs> and so I tried, I, I spent maybe a, a week or so just cleaning up and, and uh, re reorganizing the entire code base and, um, and without changing any of the actual logic, but just making it so that uh, it was maintainable, you know, and it was done like a normal C++ developer would write things. And, uh, uh, and then I presented this to the Bitcoin core developers and they resoundingly resoundingly shut me down and they're, they're like, we're not doing that. That's way too much change. Um, <laughs> rightfully so, but it was a good exercise to really study and understand what it's doing, how it works. And, um, and by the way, the, the core developer that shut me down later worked for BitPay, and <laughs> which I thought was always <laughs> kind of funny, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I kind of went all down, down on that tangent so, there. So, so but, we can, we can, can we just, take away the fact that this is not a CIA project because <clears throat> I've never once. Well, that. Oh, I, I mean, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I would be shocked if that was the case, but, um, um, I think it was most likely, uh, somebody that clearly had, um, uh, been following and trying to, you know, maybe, maybe was a participant in Cy cypherpunks or an observer, uh, you know, probably, more of a professor type, a scientist than a than a professional developer, and um, to put all the right pieces together. Um, I probably would guess there was collaborators. There were, it was not just one person, but maybe one person driving it with uh, other people, um, kind of critiquing it and uh, giving input. But so, so as a as a developer. <clears throat> Um, and, and someone who studied the source code, and this is just a question, what, what's your feelings on the time and space alternative that was, that was raised by Satoshi? Um, and we know that there's a, a, a coin out there today using that time and space uh, protocol versus proof of work. Do you, yeah. feel that, do, you, do you feel that they made the right choice? Are you talking about proof of, uh, what was it? Um, uh, proof of... Uh... Yeah, proof of space or proof of uh, yeah, t uh, time and space, and that's yeah. uh, Stefan. What coin is that? I, I can't remember off the top. Of I don't even know. Uh, it was one um, done by um, oh, I can't think of his name right now. Um, Cohen, Bram Cohen, I think. Bram, yeah, yeah. Um, I think proof of work is the right choice. Yes, uh, I think I, I even think it's far superior to proof of stake. Um, however. <laughs> I don't want to piss off all the proof of stake fans out there because we support a lot of those <laughs> coins, but um, yeah, uh, I think ultimately proof of work is the, is the, the right platform, the right consensus method. And, and the reason I think that is because of its connection to energy, uh, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are getting a lot of, you know, negative press about their energy consumption and all that. But, um, but here's how I, I, I view that. Um, the platform needs to be decentralized and uh, what's more decentralized than the sh sun shining on the earth. So as long as the sun is shining on all parts of the earth, we're going to have a decentralized platform. Proof of stake to me feels a little more too much like um, he who has the gold makes the rules, you know, the golden rule. Um, you accumulate more uh, of those tokens and you can take control of that network. And that's far easier than having to mount, uh, having to capture energy and convert it into uh, into proof of work consensus. I also happen to think that uh, Bitcoin uh, and proof of work uh, chains are ultimately very good for the environment, very good for uh, the development of energy because they're changing the economics of energy production. Um, I've had over the years, uh, many people in the in energy business come up to me. And one of the earliest ones, I think was like 2014 at the first sort of large Bitcoin conference came up to me and said, you know, I'm really interested in Bitcoin mining. Uh, and he was like a consultant to uh, the energy industry. He said, I'm really interested in it because it's a data center that you can turn off. I was like, well, that's interesting. He's like, yeah, you can't turn Facebook off. You can't just shut Facebook down, but you can shut down Bitcoin mining. And I said, well, why is that interesting to you? And he's like, well, you know, we have these wind farms that produce too much wind energy at, at moments in time, and they, they have to shed that energy. Or we have a 
natural gas well, but no right away to get the gas to anywhere useful. So we can take a container, fill it full of mining equipment, set it down on top of the natural gas well and start mining Bitcoin uh, and, and uh, um, you know, monetize it that way. And same thing with the in, uh, wind energy, solar energy. Um, uh, a lot of hydroelectricity is used in Bitcoin mining, um, especially, you know, a lot, a lot of the development in China was because they had too much energy. They had too much, too many dams that were over, they overbuilt their infrastructure in a lot of places. And these data centers were popping up right behind the dam and you couldn't get closer to the source of energy unless the water actually went through the data center. <laughs> um, and so it changes the economics for the better of wind farms, solar energy, uh, all these different types of energy. Because when they do have moments of excess capacity, um, they have something to do with it and a way to monetize that. And it, it improves the economics of those operations. And so I think it's ultimately beneficial uh, to the further development of sustainable energy uh, forms and, of energy. Yeah, and, and I, I love hearing that answer. And by the way, it was it's Chia. Uh, that, that, that's proof of time and space. And, oh. and um, you know, I've, I've said for a long time, the, the FUD around this energy thing is, is really just, it's, it's complexing to, to hear people think that that's a reality. Like, sure, does it just raw burn power? Of course it does. But, you know, think about the alternative of the energy of, you know, the, the harvesting of trees, printing paper, you know, printing mm -hmm. on the, the currency and then everything around it. Um, you know, the, the, the thought of a true digital currency society overall, I don't care how many uh, Bitcoin miners are running. It's a fraction of, of the overall uh, attack on the ecosystem that we're dealing with yeah. today. Well, uh, another aspect to it is that people don't realize that, you know, we have to talk about the block subsidy. So the, the mining uh, uh, capacity on the Bitcoin network is deliberately overbuilt for, uh, because of that block subsidy. But that block subsidy is diminishing over time and it's getting pretty small already. And so what you're left with is miners have to earn money from the whatever a person is willing to pay to put that transaction into the blockchain. So the, uh, and, and the reason people would want to pay to put something in the blockchain is because it's the most secure blockchain and it's the most authoritative record of what happened in, in the past that one can, one can have. Right. And I've always thought it would be really cool if we could start recording history and attach it to the blockchain and prove things that happened in the past so that nobody can revise history in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, but, whatever somebody's willing for whatever reason they want they need to have that most secure blockchain and they need to utilize that most supply this is a, that most secure blockchain whatever reason they have for it they're going to be willing to pay a certain amount of money to put it in there um, versus using one of the other blockchains that may be less secure and and so the market is going to decide what it's worth uh, to put a transaction into the bitcoin blockchain and the mining will follow that, right? The mine that th that will determine the revenues uh, that are available for miners, and your energy consumption will directly track the value that people get out of it, which is the way it should be, and the way all energy consumption uh, is uh, is determined, right? We don't say, hey, you can't use that electricity to, you know, heat your pool in the winter, right? <laughs> people do that because they want to do that, and um, uh, you know, and and. Uh, and there's a cost associated with that, that they either are or are not willing to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm curious. So you mentioned, uh, obviously, the, the, the proof of energy, but I, I feel like it's shifted somewhat, at least, to be much more proof of hardware, right? Where, like, I feel like the hardware is the thing that's really hard to get these days, yeah. right? Unless you're really yeah. well connected. And it feels like there's some centralization issues on the hardware production, right? Yep. There's like what half a dozen companies that actually do the hardware. Yep. Like, how do you feel about that? Because that's always been one of my concerns with proof of work. Obviously, if there's four companies yep. making all the hardware, is it really decentralized, even if they sell it, right? Like, how do you feel about that? I agree 100%. <laughs> so that is if you talk, you want, you want to talk about the the vulnerabilities of, you know, different blockchains for Bitcoin and, and the proof of work blockchains, that's one of them, uh, the centralization that could occur around the production of hardware. So what's the what's the counter to that? Well, we need more people manufacturing the hardware um, and you can take that to an extreme and start to think about open source hardware, um, making it cheaper, more and more cost effective for people to do their own chip fa fabrication, fabrication in their own small little warehouse somewhere. Uh, and that's happening. So uh, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to manufacture chips and uh, more and more available uh, in the early days of of Bitcoin. There were the, a lot of small companies that were popping up and now they've become big companies, but they were small companies <laughs> to start with. And they were, 
uh, they were buying their their own equipment and their own hardware and they were manufacturing their own chips and you know in some little you know warehouse so in, in a little industrial park <laughs> so it is possible and 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 that's another perhaps side benefit to bitcoin as well it may go the opposite direction whereas yeah we recognize there's a potential problem there um but there's also money to be earned and uh, you see intel now announcing they're getting into uh, uh chip manufacturing for bitcoin um uh which i thought was just a matter of time uh but it might also motivate uh, a lot of uh smaller companies to actually manufacture their own hardware maybe some of the big miners uh have the resources to then say, well, we're just going to build our own chips. And wow. now you have much better decentralization and you sort of advance the state of, of the art, which is where we ultimately want to get, get to, which is open source hardware from the, from the, you know, Silicon up and open source operating systems so that, um, you know, you don't have this kind of, um, you know, so the big companies like Apple and Microsoft don't have undue like power in the world. Yeah. And, well, there, there's there's really, you know, and, and we found uh, recently that that uh, um, the ant miners are, are, you know, again, it's it's proprietary hardware and they're, they're the big guys out there. Um, yeah. But it was discovered recently in exploit that a, a small percentage of each one of those miners uh, is sending hash power back to a, a, a server in China. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a problem. And so we, yep. you know, I, I can say that your theses around the, the big mining companies are going to be building their own is absolutely true. Um, yeah. recently invested in a round of that too, as well. So, I mean, the, the industry, well, that's awesome. Sure. I didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, that's, that's great to hear actually. Oh yeah. No, it, and, and everything's moving towards immersion. You know, these noisy yeah. fans and these, in these yeah. hot warehouses and whatnot is, is going to go away. No, I, the... no I, I mean, I didn't hear that, you know, some of the big miners are moving toward manufacturing their own chips, which is, would be a yep. great development. Yep. 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 And well, they're going it, not only manufacturing, but they're all moving into the immersion and, and, you know, really want to be green. Yeah. I mean, they're like, what is the maximum amount of hash power they can pull out with the minimum amount of energy? So again, uh, to your thesis, yeah. um, you know, they want to be green. They want to have the lowest cost of energy and, and the lowest usage of energy. Yeah. So um, despite the hardware centralization as it is today, you still feel that today, because, okay, five years ago, Bitcoin, I would have completely agreed would have been substantially more secure to proof of stake. Right. But you still think that's the case with today's state of hardware? Because that's been my concern, oh, yeah. right? Because oh, yeah. you really, you still think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, here's the reason, because the 51% attack is the, the theoretical attack on Bitcoin. But um, number one, any, you know, in anyone that acquires 51% of, of, of the hash power and then starts using it, uh, starts using that power that they now have would be immediately discovered. And it's a, it takes just a fraction of, you know, um, it, it takes fractionally less resources for somebody to, uh, um, um, to undermine that, that 51%. So, um, and so I, I, I don't really worry about the 51% attack problem. Uh, especially when you have, have countries starting to adopt Bitcoin and you have, um, you're getting bigger and bigger scale mining operations that, uh, but they're not all one mining operation. And, um, and yeah, I just proof of stake. It's like, just, uh, I can, you know, the federal reserve, if they wanted to just, just print enough money to go buy enough ether that they, they own 51% of it, you know? Um, I don't, I, I, you know, maybe at this point it would bankrupt the Federal Reserve, which is a scary thought. But, um, <laughs> but, but, probably not quite. Or, or. Probably not quite. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but who knows? So um, pivoting the conversation a little bit, the, there is, um, as we as we know, the industry is is exploding on the verge of exploding, you know, mainstream adoption, which is something you've now worked for, for over a decade is, is, is coming here in certain aspects, but we also see a lot of really big missteps. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, when I talk to companies and, and people that are wanting to adopt cryptocurrency, you know, payments, um, you know, there's, there's generally a lot of, uh, pushback because they've, they've done a test, they've done a trial, um, and generally it's failed miserably in the fact that they were accepting the raw, um, you know, cryptocurrencies, meaning that they were accepting Bitcoin, um, mm -hmm. or in some cases they were pushed to accept Doge or, or some meme coin, you know, for kind of a social media, uh, aspect. And, and they went ahead and in some cases sold hard goods, uh, for, for a currency. 
And because of their misunderstanding about how the entire ecosystem worked, they sold it at this. And then by the time they reconciled and, and converted it to, to usable dollars for them, you know, they had taken in some cases a 20, 30 percent loss, uh, yeah. you know, on that investment. And so then they're like, well, we're just never doing this again. Um, yeah. Now we're maturing. And, and so, you know, I, 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 without leading too much into it, you know, BitPay has, has got some very cool features about how to manage that. Yeah. And that's what we've done from day one is eliminate that risk to a business. So we process the cryptocurrency on, on behalf of the business. We accept the Bitcoin that comes in or the other cryptocurrencies that we support. Uh, and then we settle in whatever currency the, the merchant wants. And uh, typically that's dollars or euros or whatever their accounting system is, is based in. In fact, we recommend that businesses uh, get settled in whatever their accounting system is based in. Uh, because otherwise, you know, depending on where you're at in the world, you may have to account for every gain or loss uh, of all of those. Uh, if you actually take crypto onto your balance sheet, we will settle and we do settle in, in various cryptos, all the cryptos that we support. We can settle to you uh, uh, in that format. Um, we are seeing increased settlements going out in stable coins. So we, we can settle in dollars uh, on a blockchain, which is a really cool thing to be able to do. And really cool to see more and more companies doing that every day. And they don't have to take Bitcoin onto their balance sheet, but they are uh, having to install a wallet, having to figure out how to manage that wallet and, and, uh, and then take that settlement directly into their wallet. So in those circumstances, you've got the buyer paying in crypto, you've got the um, merchant getting settled in crypto, and that entire transaction happens out, outside of the traditional banking system. Uh, and for us, it's fantastic because we don't have to deal with the antiquated banks to do the settlement because the, they don't have great APIs and they don't have great technology infrastructure <laughs> to be able to do that. Um, and it's a lot of wasted effort, uh, you know, just a lot of extra effort that you have to go to to make that happen. Um, but yes, that's, we've done that since 2011. You know, that, that was the reason, a, a big reason a company would want to use us is because it enables their customers to pay with crypto. Um, but they don't have to, uh, we can handle all the, you know, accounting aspects of it, the, uh, dealing with making sure it's a, uh, a safe payment, not a double spend. You know, we do a lot of um monitoring of the various blockchains that we uh, blockchain networks that we tie into to make sure that people aren't trying to double spend and and, and such how how do, how do you guys manage the education around this <clears throat> because you know i i know so many funds i know so many companies that were talked into uh accepting a, a coin or a you know a very volatile asset um yeah. and now they're just done like they just won't even look at it again and it's it's takes well they didn't use bitpay no they clearly didn't no, no, I, I can i can tell you they they use these consultants out there that they claim yeah. they're experts and and have no idea what they're doing yeah it, i mean uh, so our business is all about payments uh so we build and, and we try to focus on payments where there's a high workflow component to it i mean we do do like invoicing and uh vendor payments and b2b stuff and that's actually a significant part of our volume um uh, but those don't, I mean, you're kind of competing with wire transfers and other things uh, with, with that uh, part of our business. For an international payment, it's, it works great. And many of our customers that do vendor payments internationally tell us that their only alternative can take months to settle and clear through the banking system. You know, they've got currency conversions. They got every bank through the correspondent banking system taking a cut. They don't even know up front what it's going to cost them at the end of the day and how much money they're going to lose and how much of FX is the banks are charging along the way. Uh, so for an international vendor B2B payment, our platform works fantastic. Um, but uh, long term, you know, we're really focused on uh, payments that have a heavy workflow component. So um, sticking with a B2B example, a great, a, a great <clears throat> use case I like to talk about is a company paying their web hosting bill. So you got maybe a maybe a company sitting in uh, South America somewhere, and they need to pay a hosting bill in uh, to a company in North America. Um, you know they can, uh, uh, you know they can uh, transact, you know, and do it instantly. You know the the uh, web hosting company gets their payment. Um, it's not going to be reversed through a chargeback. They're, they're, they have no exposure to the kind of fraud we see in the credit card system. And, uh, it, and that company in North America, it's a B2B payment, but it's like a, it's like a consumer payment because they're managing thousands of these coming in from all over the planet and they need to manage all those payments, including refunds, uh, adjustments to those, uh, um, 
adjustments to the payments. Um, they need to deal with currency conversions. Uh, so there's a heavy, and they need to reconcile it every month. Uh, and and so um, there's a heavy workflow component to that. And that's what our platform is really designed for. I'm, I'm super curious how how integrated is it? Like, can I plug into QuickBooks and like literally start doing that, or is it not yeah. quite to oh, that yeah. level yet? Oh, really? Yeah, we have QuickBooks integration. Increasingly, we're um, you know, we have NetSuite integration, uh, SAP, I, I expect will be coming soon, um, uh, including generating invoices out of those systems. So uh, you can generate the invoice on the NetSuite side and then, it'll, you know, uh, your customer can pay with crypto. And uh, yeah, it just works. How That's pretty much, awesome. Uh, how much do the banks really get upset? <laughs> about about all this because you know they're, they're so uneducated in most cases in the space I'm, and I'm sure you talk to a lot of the 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 you know higher ups that than i do um but but the education in and around cryptocurrencies and blockchain in general is just abysmal at this point are, are you seeing the same thing yeah i mean all the big banks i mean there was a period of time when every big bank wanted to do a pilot project with us and our salesmen were getting very very excited about that and i just I, I, I have experience in the banking industry prior to, not in the banking industry, but the banking software industry prior to BitPay. And I can tell you that, you know, a bank adopting just a new version of our software, that's a two or three year project, you know, just a point release, you know. And so uh, they, they're very slow. And, and so at one point, you know, we had, I just told all the salesmen, stop talking to banks. You know, we need to go get merchants. We need to go get end users of our software, not, um, not trying to use banks as a channel and, and not trying to build software or infrastructure for banks. Uh, and so we just put a complete stop that because one of those pilot projects with one of those big banks would have consumed our entire company and, and it would have, and they were just, uh, you know, kicking the tires, right? They're, they're not really interested in doing anything real. It's some people at the bank that have an interest in the technology and want to just experiment. Uh, and that's just not going to, and we're not in a consulting business at, at BitPay. So, um, all the you know different banks have different perspectives on this. Uh, some are very forward thinking, and others are not. And um, others view it as competition. Others view the opportunity. Um, and so we we partner with uh, quite a few banks. Um, there are quite a few other banks that you know have said no thanks uh, along the way. And um, I think it's both a, a, it's both competitive and it's also an opportunity. So, so you guys are, are very clearly like payment transactions, you, you're, you know, multi-chain, you know, not a little bit, a little bit chain agnostic, but I'm sure you have your, your preferences and picks. Um, well, no, I mean, we uh, I mean, we added Shiba not too long ago, <laughs> so, uh, oh, you, you know, fell, the, our you customer, that one. <laughs> um, so, uh, it was funny. I mean, we had, we had internal fans of Shiba that weren't fans necessarily because we thought it was any great blockchain technology or anything like that. Um, I mean, it's an ERC 20 token, but, um, but they kept saying, we need to do this. We need to do this. I'm like, why? They're like, cause it's silly. That's why we need to do it. <laughs> like, well, you're not, you're not exactly making a great you, business. You case, never but it hear was... those words in banking. <laughs> That's a good say. enough reason to do lots of things. I fully subscribe <laughs> to that idea. Well, well, um, and, and prior to that, we had done Doge. So when Mark Cuban and, and uh, uh, Elon Musk were talking about Doge and they and, and Mark Cuban wanted us to, uh, you know, support the da Dallas Mavericks with Doge, you know, there's a lot of debate internally of BitPay. Do we do this? Do we not do this? And I'm like, just let's do it. Why not? And it was the funnest project. I mean, uh, our engineers had a great time just coming up with like uh, even like changing, you know, the logos and all that kind of stuff when you actually make the payment and making little, you know, uh, using the the doge dog uh in elements of the ui and stuff like that so it was a lot of fun internally for for people to, i mean they just had fun with it and uh and that sometimes is reason enough to do something but you had mark cuban and Elon musk talking about it and 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 we didn't have high expectations we did it for our customer and um and then we launched it and damn it if you if it didn't, uh, you know, achieve like 15% of our payments <laughs> within Holy like a, a couple months. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, so it, it, now it's fallen back, but it's still like 7% of our payments. Uh, really? so, uh, doges. Um, so with Shiba, um, we had customers, uh, wanting to support that because of, uh, everything happening with the social media and all that kind of stuff. So, and it was an ERC 20 token. So it takes us like, you know, you know, in half an hour we can implement it. So, um, 
you know, we already have infrastructure for ERC-20. So it's just plugging in a new new currency uh, into the platform. And um, we can do that much easier than adding a full blockchain. Dogecoin was the fastest we've ever added a full blockchain to our platform. And we did it in about in about two weeks. Um, so we're getting, getting pretty good at adding uh, adding coins and, and blockchains. Um, and in the future, I expect we'll sunset some. If they're not being used, we'll turn them off. And, um, you know, we haven't done that so far. Um, but at some point, I guess, you know, if we, if we see that, okay, there's only one or two payments coming each day and it's a hundred bucks, then uh, we'll probably conclude it's not worth our time and just, just drop it. Um, um, but yeah, we haven't done that yet. So um, I think this this speaks a lot to you know a, a very big change uh, from Web two to Web three, and and that's community, um, and mm-hmm. and suddenly it's no longer you know you're not waiting for uh, the big conglomerates to say here's what we're willing to do, and and you know they certainly still drive a lot, but but the Doge thing was pushed by just a bunch of insane people you know on Reddit and a number of other <laughs> platforms that that memed their way to to adoption. I mean. Yeah. It, uh, Dogecoin's almost as old as, as Bitcoin, um, yep. and was made as as an entire joke on the entire yep. thing. And and um, and it's it listen, whatever. I don't want to piss off the Doge crowd, um, but it's not a secure uh, protocol because the owner, uh, the the original dev, can on his phone just generate as many as he wants at any point in time. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it was created as a joke, um, and uh, and then the the Bitcoin, you know, hardcore Bitcoin maximalist kind of got nasty and uh and then one of the founders of that just kind of dropped out he was like i'm i'm done with this it's not worth it but it was it was meant to be a joke and um and so uh but people say it's a it's a joke that just keeps getting better um <laughs> uh and then shiba is a joke of a joke <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um I, I mean in both cases we were our customers were interested in asking us for it so um, we look at what it's going to cost us to do it and, you know, uh, and, and just make a, a business decision about whether it makes sense to do it. Uh, in both cases, the companies, um, I mean, got tons of attention and got, um, uh, you know, great response and, you know, it was great for their brands. So it was a, a, a marketing thing for them as much as anything. And so, um, but again, the Doge community started buying everything. So they started actually using it to, to buy things and, uh, and that was great for our customers as well. Yeah, I'm curious. You mentioned it was like 12%. What's the breakdown of the rest? I don't know if you can tell us, but I'm super curious. Like, what do you um, transact go most? to? Yeah, go to bitpay.com slash stats. And we publish our stats about what blockchains people are using, what currencies people are using, uh, what wallets they're using to pay for things. Um, now, our own wallet is at the top of the list, which I, I'm kind of hesitant to include our wallet just because... A lot of times people that are using BitPay to do payments and then they have their customers do payments, they steer people in that direction. But we support over 90 wallets, 90 payment apps uh, on on BitPay. And it's very important to us to be very good partners in that. And we're not trying to push people toward our app. And um, we have our own app primarily because it allows us to innovate the end-to-end payment experience. And a lot of times we give away the software that we put into or we, we package it up and make it easy for people to pull into their own wallet. Uh, so our partner wallets, um, uh, we, if, if there's something we've done that really makes a material difference in the payment experience, we try to get them to adopt it as well. Listen, there, uh, there's no lost uh, love for MetaMasks. <laughs> yeah, MetaMasks is great. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was um, just actually and, looking and at your stats. So you're at 11% ETH and 60% yeah. BTC. So BTC oh, yeah. is like, and actually that's crazy that Doge is nearly as big as, as uh, Ethereum. Like I would have that's for right. sure okay. not guessed that. That's really interesting. But, yeah, yeah. But there's also uh, the stable coins and there's also, uh, well, Shiba. Um, there's DAI. These are, and those are all connected to Ethereum. So that stat is ETH, the currency, but you got to include all the other currencies that are running on the ETH blockchain to get a better picture of where ETH stands relative to, to Bitcoin. I guess, but that's maybe another like three or 4% looking at it. So, I mean, I guess, I, I guess I was just surprised. I figured ETH would be close to 50%, but it certainly is not, not even close. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we first added our first altcoin, which is Bitcoin Cash, um, we, uh, you know, we had some uh, investors that are like, well, this is great. We invested in BitPay because uh, 
you know, one of the theses we had was there'll be all these blockchains, you'll support them all and there'll be growth and all that kind of stuff. Well, we added Bitcoin Cash and then we added a couple more after that and they were like two or three percent of our payments. And they were like, well, what we why isn't this happening? I'm like, well, be patient. <laughs> you know, it's like when we first started BitPay, we were happy to get five transactions a day. And so, uh, you know, just sometimes people are a little too impatient. Um, but over time, you can see that mix has become very important. I mean, any coin that's two, three, four percent of our volume is very important to us. Um, and uh, and in fact, when we look at our customers, one of our objectives is to become five percent of their checkout. So if they're processing payments uh, and five percent of their payments come through us, then we think that's a point where 5% is, becomes important and meaningful. And, and so we work, we partner with our customers to try and market their products and services to cryptocurrency users and drive as much volume as we can, as much transact, as many transactions as we can uh, to reach that 5% after they go live. And then, um, and that's a big important part of what we do as a company as well. Um, a traditional credit card payment processor is not going to help you market and sell your product and service, uh, but we do. And uh, we're, we're trying, it's, you know, we've looked at the numbers and, you know, about 40% of uh, people that pay through BitPay to one of our customers are new customers. They're not just people switching payment methods. And so we're bringing new customers and new revenue to those companies. And, you know, when you get into two, three, four, five percent 5% net new customers and revenue, that becomes important. Yeah. What's the fee structure anyways? I'm curious, how much cheaper than credit cards is it? Because I can only imagine it's way better. We charge 1% to the merchant. Um, it makes the math easy. Uh, and um, yeah, compared to a credit card, you're paying 2 to 3%, uh, maybe even higher. Um, same thing with PayPal and others. Uh, and then uh, and then you have the, the, the nice feature of chargebacks, which the merchants pay for. So if you sell a product and it turns out that was a stolen credit card that bought it. Well, you know, you're going to lose the money associated with that transaction and you're going to, you've already lost your product. So the, you know, that's a big cost to merchants as well. And on top of the three, you know, two to 3%. At, at worst, you're going to have somebody try to do a double spend. We're going to catch it and we're going to reject that payment. And, um, and the only thing that can happen is if it ends up confirming on the chain, you can come to BitPay to get a refund. Um, and we're going to collect your, your KYC and your identity when you do that. <laughs> so it, as you know, BitPay continues to grow and, and clearly, you know, we, we saw, you know, 2020 and, and 2021, like DeFi is, is here and the yep. protocols are maturing and getting better. And, and, and BitPay mm -hmm. has, you know, some, some DeFi protocols. Do, do you see really a growth in that, in that sector where you are the bank more than, more than just, you know, helping them get transactions to and from? Um, well, we're not the bank. Um, I'm sorry. Could you, could you become the bank with, with more mature DeFi protocols? Um, I think the DeFi protocols will replace, uh, some of the services of banks for sure. Um, I mean, ultimately I think banks have to get back to the roots of their risk business and, uh, assessing risk when they, they do their lending. Um, that's something that will always be needed. Uh, but they're, they're getting competition on that side too. Um, but uh, these DeFi, yeah, the DeFi protocols are, are really interesting, especially the lending, what's going on with lending. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that if you have Bitcoin, you can leverage up that investment um, by taking a loan against it. Uh, if you say wanted to buy something, but you wanted to keep your exposure to, uh, to the Bitcoin that you have, um, yeah, you can uh, collateralize that and take a loan against it to make your purchase. And, um, and, and then you don't have to, you're not you're not taking the capital gains hit at that time. You know, uh, basically you're leveraging up that ex uh, that that exposure. Um, um, but yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done um, on the blockchain and in a in a decentralized way that that's currently done done by the banks. A lot of it's just math, right? Anything that's fundamentally comes down to math, you you can do it better on the blockchain. Um, if it's like assessing whether this person's going to repay a loan or not, that's a different story. Um, that 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 there's, you know, either you're going to collateralize it or you're going to need to, you know, assess that person's credibility in some way. Um, and that that's a different kind of software that needs to do that. Yeah, I mean, there there's so many amazing stories of of. Uh, 
DeFi changing people's lives. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that has to do with access to some, some very, you know, basic banking features that, that the, most of the world does not have access to. Yeah. Um, what's your breakdown of kind of global adoption? Do you see the U S is, is still the, the leader in, in where you're going to be, or do you start, are you starting to see some other countries pop up and really understand cryptocurrencies? I mean, it, it's hard to say. Um, I would probably say the U S is still leading, uh, even though it's a tough regulatory environment. Uh, um, uh, I say that just because of it's an even tougher regulatory environment in places like China. Um, and, and so I, I do think I do think the U.S. is still leading in that uh, in the innovation and the development and and whatnot. But you see um, a lot of companies domiciled outside the U.S. Most of the time that they they're, uh, they don't want to deal with the regulations that that are imposed by the U.S. Uh, a lot of times they're not even serving U.S. customers um, just because they don't want the headaches. Uh, and so um, and in some cases it's because they really are committing fraud or, uh, you know, not, not trustworthy. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't want to diminish the, um, you know, I, I would never want to say that, uh, in this world that there isn't, there aren't criminals doing bad things. Uh, and we have to be on guard uh, against that. That how does your process, do you have to KYC an AML with BitPay? Like how does that whole, whole do. situation work for you? Okay. Yeah. Just on, for the, on the merchant side, the but the people who pay, they don't. Uh, up, up to a threshold, they don't. In the U.S., mm. the regulation is at three thousand dollars and above. We have to do a KYC on the buyer, um, or we have to get that information from uh, the company that, um, if they have a custodial account with an exchange, that exchange can send us uh, some information about who that buyer is in their system, so that we can kind of correlate. You know, say, okay, here's the user, here's the account on that system that uh, if there's a law enforcement inquiry, you know, we can give them that information. They can go to that company and, and investigate whatever they need to investigate. Um, so if in the transaction it's coming from an exchange that supports it, um, that exchange can just send us that information along with the transaction. Um, you know, but if it's just a non-custodial wallet uh, and uh, they don't have that you know, there's no exchange there to give us that information. Then we have to do a KYC, a full enrollment uh, on that person if they're doing a $3,000 and above transaction. In Europe, we have to do it on every transaction. Um, and that's fairly a fairly recent development in Europe within the last year or so. Um, and a lot of people don't want to do it. They don't want the hassle of signing up for another service. And so it definitely impacted our our volumes. We were about 50-50 between North America and Europe. Uh, not 50-50, but more like 40 40 uh between north america and europe and uh, uh and and since that the um, mix is more like 50 percent europe us what you guys are looking at today there's there is web3 is the hottest new asset class um more money is pouring into it than, than actually can be utilized efficiently uh, yeah. And you're seeing, you know, some really amazing protocols and projects. Uh, I think Ohm right now is a is a perfect one. They they went from zero to three billion in, in seven months, uh, mm -hmm. and now they're coming way back down, almost as fa almost faster. You know yeah. what what's your what's your thoughts for kind of uh, the landscape over the next you know six to to eighteen months and and things to kind of look out for. Well, uh, what to look out for? Well, go to coinmarketcap.com. <laughs> And look at the thousands of coins listed there and know that 95% of them are going to end up not being worth hardly anything. Um, you know, there's a lot of pump and dump type scams going on. I, I sometimes compare this period of time with, uh, you know, pre-internet days of people trading pink sheets in these tiny little worthless companies that were just, you know, pump and dump scams. It's also very similar to the early days of just stock trading on the internet. Back in the 90s, people were quitting their day jobs and going into these, you know, nobody had internet connections at home. So they go into offices and they would sit around terminals and trade all day. And uh, so the, you know, people were quitting their jobs and day trading. And this is um, an interesting phenomenon. I think a very similar phenomenon phenomenon is happening right now. It's a lot of speculating, a lot of trading. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know which of these things is going to end up being um, something substantial and permanent. And, and which are going to go away. Um, I think Bitcoin, I think Ethereum are, you know, pretty solid bets. Um, but uh, as far as the rest of them, 
it's hard to say. And, um, and some of the ones, you know, we haven't talked about NFTs yet, but, uh, some of the ones driving that aren't really bot aren't what I would consider a blockchain at all. They're just a database <laughs> running on, they, they kind of have elements of, of blockchain in them, but they're not really true sustainable blockchains. They can't, they can't survive on their own if their corporate parent goes away. So that's not a blockchain to me. Um, so some of these are getting a lot of hype and a lot of traction, a lot of investment and whatnot, but they're running on platforms. And I'm like, that's, you know, that takes one regulator coming in and saying, you can't do that. And that the whole thing goes away. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's really difficult. And I, as an investor, I want to be an investor in tokens. I want to invest in the blockchains that are going to bring new use cases, utilize this technology for new things. And I think there's a great opportunity, practically any, um, uh, any company, you can look at any company out there today. That's, uh, predominantly like a database driven company with lots of other people plugging into it. Uh, so you think of, um, you know, companies like Ticketmaster, you, you can search Ticketmaster blockchain and there's lots of people trying to disrupt that. Uh, Ticketmaster should do it themselves. Um, but I want to be an investor in those kind of blockchains. I think the right model is, a, is an independent blockchain with its own native token that incentivizes the security of that blockchain. I think it should be proof of work. And, uh, and I think ultimately we're going to find that um, tapping into Bitcoin's proof of work is the way to do it. But a separate token and a separate blockchain with its own independent market value so that I can, as an investor, go say, yeah, here's a blockchain that's disrupting Ticketmaster. Everybody's going to use it in the future. And here's the token you have to use to pay for transactions in it. Uh, therefore, I want to go buy some of those tokens because I know there's going to be demand in the future for people to put transactions into this blockchain. And um, that's what I'm looking for uh, from an investment perspective. Um, but there's hardly anything out there, hardly anything that I think. Well, no, is... no one, no one's going proof of work anymore. <clears throat> so <laughs> exactly. You know, what, what's your feelings exactly. on, on, on all these side chains and ZK rollups and, and I think the rollups are a great idea. They should be applied to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, the, uh, uh, I think it's just a better long-term model. Now that's not, you know, we played around with central banking for a hundred years approximately. And we know that's kind of run, run its course. Um, and, uh, we may spend a hundred years playing around with proof of stake. I don't know. Um, before we figure out the proof of work is really superior. Um, so, uh, so who knows some of the proof of stake, I mean, you know, you got to think about, it. are you making a long-term investment, a short-term investment? Are you trying to front run a bunch of other people that are, you know, going to pile in, you know, are you really participating in this pump and dump stuff or not? Are you looking for long-term, uh, you know, better investments. Um, I think one of the most interesting uh, use cases, have, have y'all heard of um, this thing called uh, uh, um, stoner cats? Um, I've, I've heard of them. I don't own one. Yeah. Stoner, and nor do I, but, um, but this is a case where uh, uh, a group of people and it's Mila Kunis is kind of mm -hmm. uh, yeah. behind a lot of this. Uh, and she and her husband and, and, uh, um, uh, and, uh, um, they're, they've Aston created Kutcher, this Aston Kutcher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they've created this, uh, you know, TV show that you had to buy the NFT to be able to watch it, which is really a great idea. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, they're probably going to need a few iterations of it to figure it out. The, the big problem I have with it is I can't invest in that idea. I can invest in Ethereum but only a tiny bit of Ethereum's value is this use case. So I, as an investor, I want to invest in this, but I, I don't have a vehicle to invest in it. I, I could invest in the TV show by way of the N NFTs. By the way, they also finance the production of the TV show using NFTs, which is also a great idea. Um, but if that was on its own blockchain and you had a token um, that was needed to put transactions in that blockchain, then you can suddenly now as an investor, you can invest in the use case, the application of a blockchain to this use case. And that I would buy all day long if it existed, but it doesn't. Um, now, maybe a few iterations of this, that it, it will go in that direction. Um, but it's very interesting because, uh, you know, think about it. Um, if you bought a movie or rented a movie directly from the studio, and then you could go watch it on Microsoft's platform or you could go watch it on Apple's platform. You weren't tied into one 
particular platform. Um, that's what people would want. Everybody would want that. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, it actually just takes us back to the day where you bought the DVD and you could, whether right. it's a Philips or RCA that's or right. a Samsung DVD player, you, you, it was yours. You owned it. And we've lost, yep. lost yep. a lot of that in, in the Web2 uh, you know, changeover. And the studios should be all over this. They should want this. Uh, Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher should, uh, I mean, they have the, the influence there to make it happen. Um, they just need to bring the investors along with them, right? Because uh, as an investor, I can't, I mean, I can buy Ethereum, but that's not really investing in their use case. I, I've had two pitches directly for disrupting that industry. And I can say no one is anywhere close to yeah. even being able to discuss that problem intelligently. Yep. Yep. Uh, it, it, that use case came to us many years ago by one of our customers. And I mean, probably seven, eight years ago. And and we were like, yeah, that would be awesome. It's not what we do, but <laughs> that would be really cool. Yeah, well, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you hear pitches all day long of, of amazing, cool things that can be done in Web3 that it's just yeah. who's got the time for them all. I mean, there will be a lot of companies that just run out of gas before the, the market is there for their use case. Not that they're bad use cases, not that they're bad ideas. It's just they're too early. Um, and that's not a place you want to be. Um, I, I, another great one is uh, real estate, uh, you know, title and ownership of physical property on a blockchain. I'd love to see that happen. Um, you know, if uh, if you could, if everybody used a blockchain to track their ownership of a piece of dirt, then um, you make the ownership of land, uh, you make it possible for that to survive even a, a failure of government and a transition to from one government to a new new government. Um, which could be really a game changer. I mean, it, you sort of undermine one of the reasons somebody would want to overthrow a government. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I just think that's really cool, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that will happen. I'm sure eventually. Um, well, I, I can say, but, and, and clearly you and I have not had a chance to talk, but I'm, I'm in the process of building a uh, blockchain based title company for that exact reason. So I'm glad, I'm awesome. glad to hear that my thesis is, uh, is sound. Yeah, and I should we should talk after this because uh, I should put you in touch with a few other people that are oh, there's a lot uh, of interested in well not working on it uh, but oh, good. a company that's in a perfect position to help make that happen. Um, so the um, yeah, but it's it's one of those things. It's like maybe you got to start with a small municipality putting their records on on the blockchain. Um, but also, it's not just title to land. You know, if a company um, recorded their ownership of uh, capital equipment, laptops and things like that, then yep. auditors can just come in and say, well, this blockchain says you own this stuff, show it to me, you know, and that's, their, that's all they have to do. Um, you know, and they don't have to chase down records and prove ownership in, in various different ways. It's just right there in the blockchain to, to verify. Um, I mean, you, we could go on supply chain uh, integrity use cases. There's a lot of people trying to work on that. Another great idea. It's just you need the company, a company that's in the right position and has the willingness to sort of make it happen and start with a very small use case, a very small thing that you can bite off and get lots of people using it um, and not try to boil the whole ocean uh, with it. That's absolutely fabulous. And, 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 and again, we, we really thank you so much for your time. And, and this conversation could go on for hours. And, and I hope that you uh, will come back and hang out with us a little bit on uh, maybe one of our firesides uh, yep. and whatnot in the near future. But in the meantime, and, and while you are a, uh, a YPO member with us, um, mm -hmm. I know your, your time is limited. So I want to throw out uh, before we end today, um, we do have our own community tokens. Uh, we do believe in the utilities behind NFTs and the smart contracts uh, in and around them. So we have our uh, Y whales uh, that we have, and they actually have the utility of we, we track them. We know where they are. Um, so as a, as a YPO member, you can actually have uh, what we consider the OG uh, whale here. Uh, but we have dozens uh, of other types. Uh, this is FOMO here. He's very popular uh, and, a, and a number of others. And, and again, these are uh, they live on the Ethereum blockchain and uh, Matic sidechain just because gas problems uh, yeah. over, on, over an Ethereum are a problem. And, and when someone wants to buy a uh, 0.2 ETH uh, uh, NFT and it costs them 0.1 <laughs> in gas, uh, that's a problem. But would love to give you one of these. Do you have any preference on colors or uh, um, I'm trying to think that pay you. What, what's your company color? Blue? Uh, blue. <laughs> blue? Oh, we, we've got we've got a few blue ones. There you go. Who's, here's the blue check mark. Awesome. <laughs> Fabulous. So we'll get that over to you. Um, uh, Stephen, uh, thank you so much. Stefan, any uh, final parting words? 
I don't think so. That was super interesting, especially with just like your your huge amount of context, right? I mean, it's hard to find people that have been in for that long and actually built a company the entire time, right? And by the way, what you were just saying too, like how hard it is to be early. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you guys were early and you made it through what must have been, I don't know, like six winners or something. Yeah. So like incredible job surviving all that and then thriving. So that that's, it's been awesome. It's been awesome to me. Well, thank you very much for that. I mean, yeah, it's, um, I've had startups prior to BitPay where we were way too early and I didn't want to do that again. Um, but it seems I did to a small degree. Yeah. Well, fabulous. <laughs> we'll hang out here for one second. And for everyone else, thank you guys for uh, hanging with us today and lots and lots of uh, amazing insights uh, by Mr. Stephen Pear over at BitPay. Thank you guys so much.